Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, good morning. This is Steve Cantrell with DBA Fundamentals. This is our first session of uh, July, and probably the only one we'll have this July, except for the one down under. Anyway, we we have John Martin from Century One. Uh, he'll be doing seven things in Unity DBA needs to know. But first, we've got to go over a few housekeeping needs. Century One is our sponsor, and I'm going to let, since he works for Century One, I'm going to let him talk about this slide. So, John, take it away. Thank you very much, Steve. Or anything, um, so or anything else you want to talk about? No, really, just um, Century One. Um, we've got some great free content there, so performance.com, blogs.century1.com. Um, so people like Aaron Bertrand, Kevin Klein, uh, Andy Ewan, myself, we all blog um, through those as well as have guest blog posts as well. So uh, great free content there. Likewise on uh, SQLCentury.tv. Um, if you're interested in monitoring solutions, um, we do trials of the software. You can download them from the website. Um, Plan Explorer is free. Don't even want your email address for it. So if you want uh, something that makes deciphering uh, execution plans a little bit more friendly than uh, Management Studio, go and have a look at that one. Um, and we've got uh, Q&A forum at answers.sigperformance.com. In addition to the monitoring suite, about three months ago, we bought Pragmatic Works software. So we've got a whole raft of DevOps, testing, integration services, and BI solutions now as well. So if you're interested in that, either drop me a line or check out the website. Um, with that, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Steve. OK, thank you. Uh, DB Watch is another sponsor that we have. They have a suite of tools. Uh, also, uh, you can go to dbwatch.com. We uh, are going to have a, um, a meeting with them to where we understand all of their software and what it does, uh, but we haven't had that scheduled just yet. Once we do, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but you can go to dbwatch.com. Uh, virtual group news. Uh, we had a big uh, giveaway uh, for the first half of the year. Uh, instead of giving out money each session, because we've we've got complexity with the down under group and uh, and other groups that give away stuff or, or, or other people that do sessions for us, uh, we give away in one bulk. Um, so it's a really good prize. Um, and this time you had to be a member of PASS, must be a Twitter follow, and must be subscribed to dbafuntube.org. Um, we had to relax some of those requirements. But uh, anyway, here are the winners. Um, Donnie Penny had a $1,000 gift card awarded to him. Maria Sales had a $500 gift card. And DeWalker Parajuli had a $300 we actually had $50 left over, so we gave fourth place out to another gentleman, and I could not find the email where I sent it, but he's enjoying that $50 gift card somewhere, maybe on Amazon Prime Day today. Anyway, we have discount codes um, that um, are still good for $150 off, and because we like to always do a little bit extra, uh, if you use one of our um, discount codes uh, you're put in a pool at the end of August September sometime time frame right in there and uh, we'll give away $500 to one lucky person kind of helps a little bit more with your expenses um, so it makes sense to go ahead and use either our streaming code or our discount code and you can if you want to do uh, Click on the little camera at the top right-hand side and copy this to your desktop so you can uh, go back and find the code to register. Okay, one of the things I put this in for is I'm going, I'm going to move this out and I'm going to bring up one of the things that we're doing, and we should have already done it, but we weren't doing it yet, is we were supposed to be moving people to our website to do registration. So here's our website, and it's real easy to register this way, and it's actually great. They, they save us a lot of work with the way we set things up. You basically go to our website. Um, dbafund.org will get there also, or fundamentals.pass.org, and you can get details about 
the session and that's the session that we're going to be working over today and you can register and it might say that it's already registered probably won't work because it or probably already is registered yeah okay and then you can just go through and boom you're registered that one has a problem let's see if this one is registered and then you'll be sent a registration option now we are uh, we talked to the uh, anyway uh, we're going to probably be modifying that just a little bit but that's a nice way for you to go and register and um, instead of using the go to webinar link we're going to be using that so anyway let me go ahead bring the okay that's what I get for getting outside of it there we go okay here's some upcoming SQL Saturdays um, I may even go to this one in Louisville because that's close enough that I can run up there this weekend but anyway SQL Saturdays are free education usually in a location pretty close to you just go to SQLSaturday.com and you can look for any sessions that are close to you and there's a search in there that'll give you an idea of what's the closest to you and gives you the dates so uh, usually you have to pay for lunch and that's about it other than that it's great education great sessions um, so take advantage of that here's some upcoming virtual sessions that we have as long as well as some others um, today's uh, bad design has consequences with Gail Shaw next month and then the care and feeding of SQL Server by Jennifer McNown um, in September we've got Linux fundamentals for SQL Server DBAs by a gentleman that's a renowned Linux expert and women technology has one coming up tomorrow Inter introduction to query store by Tracy and I misspelled her name so that's not the way it's spelled um, anyway there's tons of other virtual groups uh, SQL Saturday has one coming up this Saturday also so check that out um, or SQL Saturday Saturday okay anyway there's virtual groups for pretty well every major language and most major types now we're in a consolidation effort right now to where we're getting less groups and putting more focus on certain things but uh, that'll shake out in probably the next six months but um, there is a virtual group out there that covers most of the content that you want to learn about this session will be recorded and it will be available usually within a day or so at dbafund.org or on our YouTube site at dbafundtube.org okay uh, John Martin is with Century One and we um, he will be going over seven new uh, seven things that let me go back up and look at it that all new DBAs need to know and I'm actually interested to know what the seven are I haven't seen this session anywhere so um, anyway John I'm gonna let, get, turn it over to you I've been a little disorganized this morning so sorry about that I got to move to production tonight so I've got my mind on uh, work topics <laughs> so anyway um, let me turn it over to you let me make you the presenter and then I'll mute myself once we get turned over you're okay, still not showing yet yeah. I mean, I'm just um, waiting for go to webinar to catch up with me um, oh okay there we so, go there we go perfect there we go so thank you very much for that one Steve appreciate you running through all of that um, so as Steve said we're we're going to be talking about the seven things a uh, new DBA should know um, and it's not going to be how to do something in particular these are going to be high level topics um, that look into explaining some of the, the trends and some of the tools and some of the techniques that data professionals need to know um, as the industry is evolving around us and getting into it now is an exciting time so we'll be looking to cover off uh, a number of these things um, so 
a little bit about me. Uh, my name is John Martin. Uh, I'm a product manager at Century One. I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I'm also a director at large with the, for the EMEA seat here for PASS. So if you have, one thing I, I can't emphasize enough um, is that the support that the virtual groups give to the community is, is something that we work really hard for. And if you've got any feedback, um, please give that to Steve and the team. Um, they thrive on the feedback. So things you want to see and, and things like that. Um, it's it's really important. Um, I can't emphasize that one enough. The work that they do is is all voluntary. So thank you very much to the guys. Myself, I've been working with SQL Server and Data Platform for well over a decade now. Um, I've held most roles as a dev, a BI professional. Um, but prior to joining Sentry, I used to work for Microsoft as a premier field engineer based out of the UK. All of my contact details are there at the bottom. So please feel free to follow me on Twitter, link with me on LinkedIn. Any queries or questions, you can send me an email. Um, the blog links are there as well, and I'll put this all up again at the end. So, like I said, what are we going to be covering? Um, it's it's really about if you're getting into the industry now. Um, it's a very um, busy time. Um, there's a lot of change going on in our industry with regards to disruptive technologies around containers, cloud, um, the on-premises environments are, are never going to go away. Um, that's one thing that's, that's really important to understand. But how we work in those environments is going to change potentially. Um, we're going to talk about some of the useful tools that are out there. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the free uh, and open source ones. Um, we'll also talk about some of the skills and approaches that you need to, to hone in this day and age. Um, so some of the older ways of working need to evolve a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of information, and well, there's a wealth of information out there on the internet that um, once it's committed, doesn't tend to get updated. So it's about understanding, okay, well, how do we adapt? Where do we learn and what can we learn from? Um, so that's really what we're looking to do here. And with that, we'll go straight into the first point. Um, so one of the key things now is automation. Um, now, I started when SQL Server was, well, version 2000 was just coming to the fore. Um, automation in and around there wasn't too much. You had SQL Server agent, but everything else was done through any files or batch files and things like that. Um, and automating installs wasn't the easiest thing to do back then. Um, likewise, automating bulk configuration options. There was a lot of having to roll it, your, roll it yourself using the command line um, batch files. And like I said before, but now over time, um, with the rise of sort of DevOps um, culture, but also like, estates getting larger and larger and SQL servers now matured from, from those days all the way through now to, it's the prime class enterprise database engine. Um, you look at the Gartner Match coordinates, Microsoft have overtaken Oracle when it comes to relational engines. So Microsoft is, is right up there with SQL Server and what it's doing. And that means correspondingly, there's more of it out there, there's more going on. And the key to automation is really about minimizing risk. Really sort of, as it says there, I mean, automate today what you don't want to do tomorrow. You don't want to sit there clicking through installers. You don't want to sit there having to do manual configuration through Management Studio or manually running scripts to get everything set up the way you want it to on a, a regular build. And with the things like virtualization, Azure, Amazon, as well, AWS as well, the, the ease of deployment of the OS level and things like that is coming back into the realm of the DBA. So um, with the, the, the capabilities in the virtualized platforms like VMware, Hyper-V, Amazon uh, Web Services, so the, the EC machines out there and also the um, IaaS options and, and even then platforms of service offerings out there with Azure mean that the DBAs are in a lot more control now. You don't have to go necessarily to the sysadmin team to get them to spin up an image or build a server or rack something before you can actually do your work. You've now got a lot more control. And being able to automate that, run repeatable scripts, means that it becomes very, very easy to provision new platforms, um, double check that everything's working as it should be when when the need arises. So there's no need to, I mean, you can give it to the junior or what have you, which is the common way for them to learn, um, I found when uh, my time in the industry. And being able to run through the scripts and just actually we'll just deploy this and we can concentrate on actually upskilling and learning the important elements of how to do automation rather than getting it all set up and what the features are and what the settings mean and things like that. A lot of that becomes a lot easier now. And also, it's all about documentation. When you think about GDPR that's come in, 
how do you prove that your systems are configured appropriately? Well, if you've got automation scripts in place, making sure that configurations are enforced, alerting you when there's something that may be awry, um, but also how do you guarantee something was deployed and what state it was deployed in? You go back and you can look at all of this. And with the automation, the scripts, um, things like that, you put them all into um, source control. So again, you've got that sort of master record, what was done where, when, and how, how were the scripts deployed? Everybody's working off the same hymn sheet. So essentially, if you ask any member of the team to deploy a server, if they use the same automation routines, then you can guarantee that it's going to be deployed in the same repeatable way, no matter who does that. So you don't end up with those little variances in behaviors when you've got different people building different systems. In addition to that, I mean, there's a number of really useful tools in and around that piece. Um, we need to really think about PowerShell being the, the scripting language of choice, really. Um, Microsoft has become essentially the de facto standard when you come to deal with SQL Server and the Microsoft technology stack. So much so that Microsoft now deploying PowerShell out onto, um, out onto Linux, things like that. So again, the adoption of these additional sort of technologies where Microsoft may ne not necessarily have been before, um, if you're coming in from, from a Linux and Oracle background, the learning curve is um, less than it could have been, or less than it would be. You don't have to familiarize necessarily with a whole new, new operating system because PowerShell runs pretty much everywhere, including up in the, the Azure cloud as well. Building on top of that, you've also then got things like um, open source projects, so DBA tools, DBA checks. These are really aimed at helping you just speed up the work that you're doing. So DBA Tools has got a very, very large number of commandlets um, within the module that are just really sort of, okay, well, how do you quickly and easily do backups with PowerShell? How do you do system restores? How do you check for tables? Things like that. You can do a lot with DBA Tools without having to do all that heavy lifting yourself and writing all of the scripts. Someone's done all of that hard work for you already, built it into the module, built it into a function. All you need to do now is call the function. Um, we'll have a quick look at one of those in a moment. DBA Checks is a logical build on from that one, which is all about um, using the PESTA framework to actually say, okay, well, this is what my anticipated configuration is. What is the actual configuration? Um, you can set this up to run on a regular basis and that way you can get notifications if someone maybe misconfigures or reconfigures a server when they shouldn't have done and it's almost like um, it's almost like what um, the sort of policy based management should have been really um, there's a feature within SQL Server that allows you to do that but it wasn't easy to get to work on a very large scale things like DBA checks is then we've got um, the automation scripts for things like backups, integrity checking, the, the regular sort of tasks that we would do as uh, data professionals managing a platform. And all those scripts out there are, in my view, personal view, um, the best free um, open source management suite of scripts you're going to be able to find. Um, so Ola Hallengren, um, Scandinavian gentleman who's published all of this and won numerous awards from the community for this one. But yeah, I mean, taking backups, index maintenance, stats maintenance, um, integrity checking, these written stored procedures that you deploy onto a system, and then you just schedule them through the agent jobs and off you go. Um, makes life a lot easier. Again, you've got a standardized capability across all of your environment, which just leads through to, okay, if it's the same on every machine, it becomes a lot easier to troubleshoot. This is a lot easier to work with. Everybody can just build up that same sort of knowledge base. So those are some of the useful tools I'd say to have a look at. And then finally, the the, the rise of Kubernetes, Docker, and containers. Um, these are, are technologies where they're getting close to being production ready um, in certain circumstances. Is they're really, really useful spinning up um, standardized images for your development test environments and things like that to, to test what's going on with them. Um, it's all command line driven again, very easy to do. Um, so Kubernetes, you can just say, okay, well, I want to spin up X number of SQL servers, connect them to some some persisted storage and things like that. Um, Joey from um, Dentarius and Associates has got a really good blog post that goes into how to set that up initially and getting started with it. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure the slide deck's available for, um, after the case, and we've got a whole pile of links and extra information in the notes fields for the slides. So you'll have all of those links. Now, before we move on, we'll just have a quick look, just a quick sort of diversion um, into uh, VS Code here. We're gonna run some, some PowerShell. Basically, what we're gonna look to do here is deploy three quick containers um, and then, 
basically connect them and then install Ola's main scripts using the DBA tools commandlet to do the same. So essentially what we can do here is I'll just uh, set some um, variables and these are the values. So I'm going to say I want three containers. Um, we're going to start port 1433 and then we're just going to use that as a counter. I'm going to increment through. So what we're going to do here is just a, a while loop and basically say, okay, um, while well, the number of containers is um, less than or equal to my counter, just set this command up, which is the, the Docker command here to actually go and run uh, the containers, uh, basically get them up and running. I'm going to say, here's the listener port that we want the host to have. This is the port that's going to be mapping to internally um, and which image we want to use. Now, before the session here, I actually went and downloaded that image onto my machine rather than take the, the sort of four or five minutes and swamp the webinar network connection. Um, and then we're just going to run the command and then we're just going to iterate through. So I mean, that becomes a very easy route there. So off it goes. Uh, that should just run that for us. So that's the first one coming online, second one coming online, third one coming online. And then we can just say, okay, well, yep, there they are. They're starting to come up and running. So we'll give that uh, a couple of moments just to get online properly. But I mean, that just illustrates the power of automating it, things like PowerShell and Docker. I've now got three basically identical SQL servers deployed for allow, that now allow me to connect to them and do things like create databases, so on and so forth. Just there we go, and that was what, 15, 20 seconds at most. Um, so nice and easy to do. Yes, you can pull the image down. You can create your own images as well for it. Um, this one here, so last day, I'm just gonna connect to my local host. Um, uh, uh, nope, that's the wrong. So I'm gonna set a, a credential here because I'm gonna connect with um, SQL authentication. So do that one. Set the password. Okay, so that's me all set up there now to be able to connect and do these. So again, I'm just going to loop through all three instances there, um, and then I'm just going to have those all deployed, and it should pick up. There we go. So what it's going to do is going to download the maintenance solution. It'll deploy those, and then it moves on to the next one. There we go. And again, so I can start this with one, five, ten servers I can deploy the same maintenance solution across all of them like that very very quickly um, so that's again this is just a, a very very simple illustration of why automation is very very important and it's something that any data professional now really should be looking to invest some time in learning um, in order to, to be able to, to get themselves up to speed just so that they can basically move on to doing the more important things so building servers it's a very easy commodity task we get it done being able to go on and start learning to do performance tuning, things like that, database design, that's the more important element because, again, with the rise of the, the cloud, um, that becomes more and more important. So um, that's that one over. So moving on to point number two, speaking of the cloud, um, don't fear it, it's coming, okay? Um, there's been a lot of a lot of hype around the cloud. Um, first thing, uh, straight off the bat, don't believe the marketing hype. Um, it's still going to need DBAs, data professionals, data platform engineers, essentially. The roles may change a little bit from racking and stacking servers, which is going away, to, okay, we're going to run virtual machines in the cloud, we're going to run platform as a service, so database as a service in the cloud. But you're still going to need those core skills. Okay, well, we need to provision a database. We need to make sure that it's re-indexed appropriately. We're going to need to make sure that we know how to tune the performance on it, that type of thing. So the, the DPA role is, is going to evolve over the next sort of three to five years where cloud is going to become more prominent. As I said earlier, the on-premises environments that we work with now, not going away, not in a million years, but more common, we're going to start seeing hybrid environments. We're going to see these deployments where we're also including certain cloud elements to it, whether it's full database engines, whether it's remote storage, whether it's backups going to the cloud, there's always going to be a little bit of it there that we need to be aware of. Okay. Now, as I said, one of the key things with the cloud is it's going to really sort of emphasize the, the performance tuning elements of our jobs. So when you think about, okay, we're charged a fee on a regular basis and it's about how much compute memory and storage we're using. 
So one of the key things to understand now is that with the, 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 with the rise of these sorts of uh, subscription-based, consumption-based services that businesses are starting to look for, if you can go in and performance tune a query, you can performance tune database workloads, you're going to, if you can do it better than the next person, you're going to be in a very, very strong position because you're actually going to have a tangible benefit to the company by saying, I can reduce the amount of resources we're using, which translates into a saving of X. And that X is a real tangible value when you look at the monthly spend of a business. So it's still going to be very important to make sure you've got all your maintenance routines in place, but I'd say go and have a look at focusing when it comes to the cloud side of things on, on the performance tuning, understanding database modeling things like that because that will have a big impact and it will make you more employable in the industry as the industry is evolving okay now in addition to that i also touched briefly on it earlier around the the rise of the sort of self-serve side of things so um the need for learning sort of some of the what i term the courses admin skills around identity management networking and storage um the network admin and the storage admin I'd probably be worried about because going to Azure, if I would provision uh, a VM, I don't need to speak to the IAOS team or I don't need to speak to the, the sysadmin team, things like that, or the VMware team or the storage team. I can just, in a couple of clicks of a button, go in and say, okay, I want storage account, three VMs, here's my, VM, here's my network, and we're up and running with SQL Server. And that's all that I can do very, very quickly. But making sure you do it right is important. So going back and learning some of those those skills again around well, how does Active Directory work? How does Azure Active Directory work? How does AWS Active Directory work? Things like that will help you then, again, when we start looking at those hybrid environments that many, many companies now are starting to use. From a networking perspective, spinning up virtual networks is just mouse clicks or PowerShell away, but understanding how to make sure you set the subnets up correctly, because once you've got them in place, tearing them all down and then redeploying them if you've got ranges that don't work so go and have a look and start making sure you, you understand things like um sort of ip addressing subnetting um what the different subnet masks mean how to calculate how many usable addresses within a range things like that um like i say i've got um a couple of things to to some useful cisco um materials in the notes part of the um, slide deck so feel free to download the slides and, and make use of that and start going for that one likewise when it comes to storage storage is now abstracted uh, an awful lot you're not talking about LUNs when you get to the cloud but also many on-premises solutions you look at the the likes of pure they're making it very very simple to deploy very high performance storage without needing to know the bits and the bytes of how a storage array hangs together they're, they're making that again self-service me as a dba i know i need twenty thousand iops thirty thousand iops it becomes very easy for me to now go and deploy that rapidly using some of the newer more intelligent storage arrays that will be on premises so it doesn't just sort of link to, to say okay well if you're dealing with the cloud you need to know this if you're dealing with on-premises you don't because again a lot of that technology a lot of those um which come the essentially the, the concepts are filtering their way down to on-premises and the way that many vendors now are actually deploying their own hardware and their own appliances they're taking that self-serve ethos and putting it there firmly in the hands and empowering or allowing the empowerment of the dba teams and the storage team everyone that needs to be able to do that to deliver it and then finally the last thing to think about really is is the rise of non-sql technologies uh, the developers in this day and age are building large enterprise grade global scale applications and it's not all built on relational engines um, they still have a very very key job to play um, but on the periphery you're going to see things like sort of what they term no sequel um, so you may see things like uh, cosmos db which is a document store uh, it's got a cassandra interface graph engine sql server in, in 2017 now we have the ability to run certain graph queries within sql server itself as well we've got json types and the ability to do some json processing in there as well much like we have historically had with xml so it's not just about the the relational engine and how it hangs together with indexes primary keys and all that sort of stuff there's also these other data structures and such like that will sit around that i mean with 2016 sql server microsoft give the ability to use polybase to ingest information connect to how to do that type of thing um like with uh, azure sql data warehouse and 
APS appliances. So this connectivity to external data sources to be able to pull information in to the relational engine into a query language that a lot of people are very familiar with becomes more important. So understanding how to piece these things together and build these hybrid environments that comprise some of the cloud, but something on premises as well, are gonna be very, very important. But one thing I will say is that the, the data professionals such as us, um, DBAs, uh, data platform engineers, as I think we're evolving into, is going to be very, very important because we understand data. And that's the currency that many, many businesses and countries are now running on. So having an appreciation for, for what's out there in the slightly wider world is going to make things a lot easier for us as we transition over the next three to five years. And I mean, a, a good example is, is just looking at the Azure portal and thinking, okay, how many services does Microsoft have available in its cloud? And with that, we're thinking um, several hundred, maybe. Um, it's changing every day. I mean, with, you think about what's going on there at the moment with the advance for, say, managed instance. Um, this is a new form of SQL Server that's coming in. Um, so we think about, okay, what options we've got for running SQL Server these days? Well, we've got on-premises physical, virtual. We've got in the cloud, in virtual machines, we've got RDS for SQL Server, we've got Azure SQL Database, we've now also got um, Managed Instance, which is another flavor of SQL Database. And all of these things are fundamentally SQL Server that we all know and been working with or are looking to work with. They just got slightly different spins on how they hang together. But then around that, I mean, you look there, you've got Cosmos DB, you've got open source databases there as well. There's the migration services, there's um, the ability to synchronize data across different places as well. All of that's facilitated through various different elements of the cloud. So well worth having a look at. Now, the first two automation, bringing on um, uh, and dealing with the cloud, this is something that not everybody can learn very, it's, it, we're all gonna have to learn about when to go and ask for help. This is an important trait to have. Um, now, I, I'm always, oh no, I just turn around and say, ignorance is something that people, uh, it's an accusation people level um, have leveled at them, and it's not a bad thing. Um, ignorance is just simply the lack of knowledge or information when you look at the, the dictionary definition of it. And I will happily admit there's areas that I still do not know in and around SQL Server because it's become so expansive. Um, I concentrate on the areas that in trust me, which there's quite a wide variety of. But understanding, okay, well, I don't understand or I don't know this information. Right, I need to get some help. I need to go and ask someone for some help. So there's a couple of things there. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, at Century One, we've got um, the answers.sqlfornus.com. You've also got um, Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, SQL Server Central, a whole raft of community um, around there that's that's really there for people to help you learn if you've got questions, you've got queries. But one of the more important things to do is, yes, you can ask for that help, but do some research first. Um, go to Google, go to Bing, um, your search engine of choice, whatever you want to do, and start trying to sort of Google around it. Find what um, what is the problem scope? Understand what that is, because by understanding better what that is, it'll help you ask a better question. So it's really okay, well, who do we go and ask? Well, as I said, you've got um, all of those those resources there, but what to ask and how to ask it, well, there's a link there, which basically has got some resources where you can start saying, okay, well, this is how I go and ask for information. This is how I effectively ask questions. Um, make sure you provide as much information as possible. If you're getting an error, for example, include the error text. Don't do a screen grab of it, copy and paste the information because sometimes the stack dumps or anything like that that come back or the error messages can be quite long. Um, then also, you've also got um, things like Twitter. So you've got the, the SQL help hashtag. Um, if you can fit it into it's about 200 characters now, then that makes life a little bit easier. Um, if it's short, sharp information, oh, I need pointer on this. Again, you're going to get people chiming in to help you at every opportunity. Beyond that, if you can seek out a mentor, um, either at work or within the community, um, now there is a couple of sites out there for um, that, that help connect mentors with people who want mentorship. Um, plural sites, including one of those as well. So the, you've got a lot of the people who are published up there offering to, to, to do mentorships as well. 
Um, so well worth exploring those options. And that again can just help you speed up the, the learning process. And then there's also obviously um, coming to conferences like Summit, like SQL Saturdays, um, attending these virtual groups, things like that. They all help sort of solidify and, and formalize that knowledge in and around the, the wide arena that is data platform. And making sure that you do that when you do get that information, it's all about looking and saying, okay, well, I need to build my own knowledge base up. So OneNote, um, Evernote, wikis, anything like that. Um, I mean, the, the number of people, and myself included, have gone, oh, I'm looking for some information, type in, what's this? And you find a blog post you may have written yourself. Um, that sort of commit it down, um, write it somewhere that's easy to search, and then, when you do have that question, you can check your own knowledge base first, and then you can go to the internet, then you can go and ask for help. But then it also means that you can start helping others as well with that information that you've you've accrued. Now, one of the other things as well within the knowledge base is, is about establishing a trust network. And this is something that goes back to the the very sort of depths of time with, with human social interaction is you're inclined to trust people and you you give a greater weight to people that you trust rather than just some random stuff that you find on the internet and there's a lot of random stuff out there um there's a lot of it that's wrong there's some of it that's pretty much right there's some of it that's it was right when it was written but the technology's moved on and i can't i can't tell you what's there and what's not what's good and what's bad um because again a lot of it's going to be subjective around how how you learn, but I mean, some of it may be out of date. Have a look for when that was published. See if there's any contradictory articles, things like that. But then also look at social media. Who are the, the big hitters there? You've got the likes of Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Brent Ozar, Denny Cherry. Um, all of these people are, are very, very trustworthy sources of information, incredibly knowledgeable and always willing to try and help you out if you want. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Just do it in the right way. So building on to that one, um, the key one here is around database design principles. And I don't think this, in, in my experience, gets enough focus. Um, so I spoke briefly about when we move to, to cloud environments, when we're dealing with, with things like that, being able to tune workloads is very, very important. It's gonna have a lot of impact on how much money is being spent by the business. And obviously that, if you can save them money, then obviously they can look to divert it and full high and that. By understanding some of the core database design principles, things like normalization and other concepts that will underpin database design, that will help you then move on to performance tune things better, make sure you're using minimal storage that you need so you're not NVARCHAR max for everything. It's just not a good design pattern. Um, it just doesn't scale. And, and things like that, you start off small but build with a view to, okay, this is gonna potentially grow in a lifetime of an application. Now, coming back to asking for help, um, people like uh, Karen Lopez, Thomas LaRock are, are good sources of information for this one. Um, they're sources that I've, I've sort of drawn upon in the past and um, would, would really recommend that uh, you look at those as well. But I mean, it comes down to something as simple as, okay, how do we design a database? So tables, views, primary keys, foreign keys, all of those things go into some of the, the principles. We think about normalization, first, second, third, fourth normal forms, the elimination of basically repeating data. Understanding that is gonna help you build better databases, is gonna help you performance tune better. It's very, very important information that from an operational standpoint, a lot of companies don't look to invest in anymore. Now, Taking that one step further, um, once you understand those concepts, is to understand the different design patterns that may exist there for the database workloads that we see. So understanding the difference between a sort of an online transactional processing OLTP system versus a decision support system, which is geared primarily towards reporting. So when you think transactional platform, that's gonna be your line of business, order system, for example, patient system, things where the transactions are gonna be small, they're gonna be in and out really quickly, that type of thing. That's where you want short, sharp, snappy transactions, generally, um, versus decision support systems where you may end up with longer queries running, but they're gonna be predominantly sort of selects, that type of thing, where people are trying to extract 
extract information into reports, uh, Power BI, reporting services, anything like that to inform decisions. And then when you start thinking about decision support system, you're going to be thinking, okay, well, the Kimball Star schemas versus the sort of Inman um, corporate data warehouse, which is a more relational engine. And then there's also things like Data Vault out there as well. Again, it's about understanding okay, what's going to be appropriate for the types of workloads that we're working with here. Um, by and large, you'll see the vast majority of them being Kimball star schemas underpinning things like analysis services, be they on-premises with SQL Server, Fast Track Data Warehouse, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, or APS. So these are all technologies that then basically look to present that information layer to allow us to query and facilitate the querying of it. So you've got a lot of these sort of logical constructs, a lot of the design components here is what is our workload, how does it hang together? what are we looking to try and achieve and all of these things will build on top of each other from the understanding of the normalization concepts to the different design patterns that are out there um, all the way through to understand the actual physical implementation differences um, so if you think about sql server that there's a really sort of um, two common things that jump to mind so you think oracle you think sql server so primary so uh, clustered indexes and cluster keys and things like that in SQL Server are actually radically different to the implementation in, in, in Oracle. They're not necessarily needed there for the structured data. You come to SQL Server, they can have a very big performance impact in the way that, depending on the type of workload you're dealing with, how that works. Likewise, when you think about querying it, cursors are great in Oracle, they're not great in SQL Server typically. But also thinking about the implementation side of things is, security now security is part of the database design um this is something i'm i'm very sort of adamant about dbas are one layer in the security um sort of thought that we're building in and around data platform solutions so the only way to effectively do security is secure by design okay you can bolt things on afterwards you can um set up the security in the SQL Server, you can set the logins and all that sort of stuff. But if the database is not inherently designed with a secure mindset, then you're fighting a losing battle. So you, this is where working with um, the development teams and things like that to say, okay, well, I need you to, you understand what the process is that are, are doing data access need. So make sure you build effectively da effective database roles, assign the securables to the roles and that way the dba's job becomes a whole lot easier you can concentrate on securing the infrastructure layer and then all you need to do is drop users into the group into those database roles link them to the logins and away we go it simplifies the role that you're doing and allows you to concentrate on the bit that's within your control wholly okay so again when you think about the implementation side of things work collaboratively with the development teams things like that push that security back to them as well and we all need to work together to deliver this. So sticking with, uh, with that, it's all about effective communication. And this is something that we need for when it comes to asking for help, uh, working with others, mentoring, being mentored, the design and security principles, things like that, working with the DevOps culture. Essentially, it's not, DevOps is not developers hacking around in production. It's a collaborative, multi-skilled team looking to do effective delivery and maintaining system availability whilst continually adding enhancements and making sure the system is productive for the business or whatever it needs. It's about leveraging the strengths that everybody has within a multi-skilled team to get the end result. Um, so that's something that we need to look at. Now, effective communication is not just CCing people on emails and just sending them out to all and sundry. There's a few things that that we need to do. And more importantly is, is understanding the needs of the business and the end user is very, very important. This ties into us being able to build and deliver effective data platforms. Okay, um, our maintenance routine. So we need to basically understand when's the business not working so that we can do things like index operations, backups that may take a longer period of time, put some extra workload on a particular server that otherwise may impact the performance of a critical line of business application. I'm just building on that, which are the critical line of business applications that we need to make sure are either highly available um, or we've got a good sort of restore strategy um, set in place so that we can provide business continuity in the event of a major failure. And we can only really do this by building up a rapport effectively with our, our colleagues, with users, with the business, asking them the right questions, asking them, um, okay, well, 
what are your needs? How can I deliver this? What and, and then educating them as well and say, look, I know you want that, but it's really just not feasible. So part of the effect of communication is, is is understanding the types of people you're dealing with, understanding what their needs are, but at the same time being able to say no. Um, this is something that not a lot of people do. I mean, I'm, I've been guilty of it in the past myself, is, yeah, no, nope, not a problem. I'll, I'll do that. I'll get that for you. When in reality, I should have said, I'm sorry, but I'm swamped. Um, I'm not going to be able to deliver that for you in a timely way or, or as well as it could be. Maybe you need to speak to someone else. Um, it's about being honest with people. It's about being um, very sort of clear in, in how you do things without being abrupt. Now, how do you understand how to communicate with people? Um, and how do you effectively communicate with people? And this is um, an age old problem. Now, um, there's a couple of things um, or, or sort of survey type um, tests you can take. The one I'm more familiar with is, um, is the DISC um, analysis, which essentially is um, helping define sort of ma four major categories for um, how people um, react, their natural and adaptive styles. <laughs> Excuse me. So we think about the natural style. This is how when you're just doing your regular job, um, what are your traits? How do you um, how do you react? And then we think about the adaptive style, which is when you're under pressure, what do you fall back to? Okay. So how do your reactions change? By helping understand the the people that you're working with um, and the ones that you're communicating with. The types of personalities, that type of thing, will help you formulate the type of language to use, the way to communicate. Do you want to communicate via email, a phone call? Is it better to speak to someone face to face? All of these things are things you need to take into account to, to facilitate that effective communication, both within the team, within the department, and within the business as a whole, when you're dealing with users, when you're dealing with customers, anything like that. I mean, those letters there uh, and what they mean is you look at the decisive interactive stabilizing and courtships different sort of traits that you you have um so the higher on a d value uh, it really it's a case of be short sharp quick basically okay give them the information they need so they can make a decision really quickly and then get out of the way versus someone in sort of in the green stabilizing side of things you, you're it's all about building things up slowly um, involving them in a discussion things like that and once you you understand these people then and how to speak to them effectively you can work closely and work better with them and that's what's what's really important now obviously it helps if everybody takes these tests and publishes their disc scores that's my one in the background actually um not always easy to do but through interaction so catch up with people at lunchtime over the water cooler, that type of thing. Just have a general chat, how you watch the game at the weekend, how you doing, that type of thing will help you understand the types of personalities and the people you're dealing with. That then helps you do effective communication. Coming in now to, to think about business continuity. Um, this is probably the single most important skill that you hope you never have to use. Um, this is all about how do we get a system and a business up and running again when the worst has happened, okay? So we touched briefly on high availability earlier, which is an implementation detail um, when we think about what we're building, um, doing that discovery for, for what a system is and how it needs to be available all the time. Then we come across the business continuity, which is server room burnt down. Okay, how do we bring the system back online when we're dealing with a catastrophic situation? Now, the important thing to understand is that whilst we are focused sort of primarily on the data platform layer, that forms part of a larger solution, um, where there's application servers, where there's end users in play, all of this sort of stuff, potentially external data sources. So one of the key things we need to understand is recovery time objectives and the recovery point objectives. So the recovery time objective, how long do we have to bring the system back online? How long does it take to bring the overall solution online? How long do we need to take to bring the database, the data platform back online? And where do we fit into the grand scheme of bringing the system back online? And really, this comes back to what we spoke about on point five with effective communication. We need to, we need to speak to the business. We need to speak to the end users. We need to speak to the other teams as well to understand, okay, well, how do we fit into this bigger picture to be able to effectively deliver what we have to when it's all gone south? Likewise, recovery point objective, how much data can the business afford to lose? So this is typically measured in a duration, so three hours, four hours, 15 minutes, things like that. 
okay once you've got this information you understand how important that data is it then lets you build up the recovery strategy so the recovery strategy is more important than a backup strategy once you know how to basically how long you've got and how much data you can lose you can then start taking that information and deriving how do i build a backup scenario that will facilitate my recovery point objective my recovery time objective essentially my recovery strategy so it does seem a little bit everyone says oh i have a backup strategy the reality is you need to have a recovery strategy first a restore strategy and that will tell you which types of backups you're going to be taking how to be taken where they need to be stopped what this needs to be through them things like that and we need to start thinking about are we solely responsible for this or are we working with conjunction say a, a backup team who've got our backups go straight stream straight into these backup devices that are doing dedupe and compression fantastic for doing backups not necessarily great when it comes to try and do a restore and you need to rehydrate these systems so there's a lot of potential pitfalls there and you can only get to doing that by understanding okay well let's go and test this and this is where um there's a, a gentleman in the uk called um, stuart moore who's done some fantastic blog posts around taking and automating backups and then testing them from integrity perspective um all with powershell so again that comes back to point one automate everything that you can so you don't want to be manually testing things and taking a couple of days out to do some stuff you want to automate these routines because if you've got it automated already for testing when it comes to actually doing it for real a lot of that is automated already you just need to plumb in the right information to perform those restore actions what that means is that you can be confident that yes we're doing this in the right order we've tested it and going by previous tests we know roughly how long this is going to take so that when you've got the business coming out you're going we need the system online now you can actually go back and say actually based around our previous requirements and our previous testing we anticipate it's going to take x y and z to actually deliver the system back online which is within the recovery time objective and in line with the recovery point objective being able to give the business and the people who are asking for the systems come back online that level of confidence is very very important because these business continuity scenarios can be very very stressful a key thing there again understand the objectives and where the data platform fits within the systems that are around it um, if you know that the data layer comes online you've got web services you've got websites you need external connectivity and connecting to external web services all of those things and typically a lot of them can be restored in parallel to a functioning level and then turned on together one thing to bear in mind with this as well that's not on the slide is in and around things like um, compliance requirements so gdpr is a good one if you're having to restore to a backup is the business ready to start replaying in data remediation or data erasure requests that may have been may have been submitted by customers or, or what have you in that time between okay well there's the backup and we've got five of these to replay is it something that you can do automatically or is it something as well that needs to play in so it's more than just getting that system back online it's about understanding where it plugs into the business as a whole so business continuity it's one of those things that if you start understanding okay well how do i optimize the performance of a backup that's great but understanding okay well how do i do an effective restore how do i make sure the system's got high integrity is it need to be logically consistent if it comprises multiple databases things like that these are all things that you need to start going off and, and understanding it's not just a simple pull that file from the file share and restore a backup to a server necessarily sometimes it is but more often than not when we start into business continuity scenarios there's a lot more moving parts and understanding and communicating effectively is the thing that really helps us do these things moving on to the last section now number seven is having a troubleshooting methodology um, the important thing to understand here is accept the stuff goes wrong it breaks it's the way it works servers fail queries go south SQL server gives you a duff execution plan um, statistics go bad they're skewed that type of thing okay the most important thing to hear is to have a methodology have a playbook um, refer to that knowledge base that we spoke about building earlier or about when you're learning and building and, and asking for help don't jump straight in um, this is a, a common mistake is okay oh we've got a problem we must fix it now and everybody jumps in both feet first and off you go and you lose control of the situation and people start making changes without understanding okay well we made four changes which one worked which one made it better which one made it worse okay so 
take that breath, have a cup, grab a coffee, sit down, approach it in a methodical fashion. Okay. Now, when it comes to SQL Server and the Microsoft Data Platform, um, the weights and cues methodology is a strong foundation on which to build. Now, essentially, what you're looking at here essentially is the okay, I've got performance counters and I've got weight stats. Either in isolation will basically only give you half the story. Okay, you can start looking at it and say, okay, well, IO latency is at 25 milliseconds. That's terrible going by the stuff that's published on the internet. The reality of it is eh, maybe it's not. Have a look at what have a look at the weights and say okay well are we seeing large amounts of, of storage io weights and things like that in correlation and it's about un understand that correlation between performance counters and the various different weight stats that you see in there there is a white paper from microsoft that goes into to a lot of detail around this some of it's very good some of it's a little bit wider than mark brent ozar did a very useful um summary of the white paper um and pulls out a few things to to take with a pinch of salt um, but also homes in on really it's about understanding that correlation between weight stats and perform counters to give you that that fuller picture but you also need to in conjunction with that build baselines um, so you can do it with data collector sets in Perfmon. if you haven't got a third-party tool there's third-party tools out there but essentially what you need to do is look at okay establish a baseline once you have a baseline, when it comes to troubleshooting a problem, you can enact your methodology. You can come in and say, okay, in this scenario, what can we rule in and what can we rule out? If you've got a baseline, then you can see that 25 milliseconds is normal storage latency. So, okay, I can put less weight on that particular metric and start looking in other areas. If you haven't got a baseline, you need to basically go through everything and rule them out one at a time, which can lead to a longer time to resolution. And by having a troubleshooting methodology in place, that's what helps you get those resolution times much, much quicker. Um, in addition to that, have a runbook. Um, like I say, you know what you're doing. This is the run which checks do I need to perform? Do I need to go and get all of the logs? So if it's a highly available system built on Windows failover clustering with available groups of failover cluster instances, have you got the cluster logs? Have you got all of the um, SQL logs, have you got anything else that you need to be able to look at it and get the whole picture? Um, there's a really useful set of tools up online now as well. So some of the useful tools that are available to us um, that have been around for a long time, so SQL Diag, PSS Diag, Diag Manager, um, Nexus and RML utilities are all tools published by Microsoft geared towards the collection of, of lots of internals information and useful information processing of it and then the reading of it to allow you to get insight as to why something's gone wrong then you can also think about some of the other useful tools that exist that are produced by Lux of Adam Mechanic the SP who's active store procedure which is a it basically is the best kitchen sink procedure you're ever going to find when it comes to try and figure out what is my server up to right now um, that store procedure if it's it, when I was building SQL servers that was part of my standard build every server would go out the door with who is active on it quite simply because then i knew that when it came to doing the troubleshooting i could rely on the scripts that i built up around it to say actually i need to run this and i can start getting some insight about what's going on right now likewise glenn berry's um, dmv scripts huge wealth of information that you can gather put it into the spreadsheets provided and then again you can start deriving insight from you don't have to go and write all of these from scratch you don't have to build your own script library they're published there for us to use already now one of the key things that underpins this whole methodology is understanding and saying okay guys we need to log everything we were doing when we're troubleshooting this problem what time did we notice it at what time did we start doing things and what did we do how did we observe the effect that that took place okay just catalog it and this is where something like onedrive office 365 really comes into its own with a collaborative working space because then the whole team if they're working on it can keep an eye on that spreadsheet or the word document or the OneNote document in real time and see what others are doing at that point in time but also after the fact once you've resolved the situation you can go back and start looking at doing root cause analysis once you go back and start looking at that okay well what was the timeline through to the resolution okay what can we improve what did we do really well what do we need to do more of and then also you can provide a report to the management then and say well this is what happened and here's the root cause we need to go and fix this proactively before it happens again something like that makes life a lot easier it gives you a lot of um credence it gives you a a lot of gives the manager a lot of confidence in what you're doing as a data professional when it comes to building managing and maintaining these systems 
So with that, that's our seven things that I would suggest. Um, we've seen some useful tools. Um, there's a wealth of information out there. The slide deck's got a whole pile of um, extra information in there. Um, like I'll make sure that's published for you, have you see the thing, um, or I'll put it up on SlideShare or something. And with that, have we got any questions at all, Shane? Hey, John, great session. Um, a lot of the questions came in, we were kind of able to answer for you, so I'm afraid we've taken all your material. Okay. <laughs> so no, that's that. perfect. That, that's, that's nice and easy. It means we're we're going to run to time. Um, in that case, then um, one thing I will say: thank you very much for your time today, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to listen to me rambling on about the seven things I think that a, a new DBA or data professional needs to to have. Um, my contact details are there. Please feel free if you want to raise any queries, questions. Um, you got any suggestions? Um, about actually, no, I don't think we need that, or did you consider this? Um, please feel free to drop me an email. I'm always happy to, to learn and, and get feedback from people. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, I need to make you the presenter again, Shane uh, or Steve? Well, I was gonna I was gonna finish up, but I just wanted to say thank you because I was really impressed with this session because I didn't expect it to be like this. It, this type of stuff is actually better than a step by step guide to do backups and the, the overall. Um, I guess I wanted to jump in just to express how not how really well I like this session. Um, Thank the you. types of things that you were talking about are the types of things that people need to think about when they first get into this. And I also sent out a message to everybody about DBA tools and DBHX. I had actually never heard of that before. Um, and then they were telling me that you've actually had some stuff submitted and accepted in that. So it really yeah, looks neat. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Chrissy and Chrissy and the team have done a fantastic job with those tools. And to the point that now Microsoft have pretty much given up trying to build their own ones because this is far surpasses anything they've done to date. Oh, I'm going to definitely check it out this afternoon when I have, get a little time. So I just wanted to say that and jump back on because uh, I w wasn't planning on being here, but I thought I, I got to go back and say something. But anyway, thank you. Thank, and thank you very much. Uh, we have a session coming up, and I explain that uh, with bad designs have consequences with Gail Shaw uh, next yep. month. So definitely take a check. Uh, look, look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much.